Hi guys, welcome to Cryptids Canada. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day today. Uh, it is uh, July the 1st, Canada Day. And if you are celebrating Canada Day, I hope you have a, a wonderful time. Okay guys, this one is called A uh, Haunting in Oklahoma. I have literally had to start this video over three times. I am looking at the title. It's highlighted. It says, A Haunting in Oklahoma. But for some reason, I kept saying, A Haunting in California. I'm looking right at it. And so I'd have to go back and restart. But I actually got five minutes into the story went back to check the editing and realized that I had said California again. So I had to restart the whole thing because cutting and clipping is a big pain in the neck. Anyways, so this is called A Haunting in Oklahoma. Oh my gosh, I actually got it right. Okay, guys, on with the story, finally. Many years ago, we lived at the end of a long road it was actually the last house on the left, although this has nothing to do with the story. Previous tenants told us of odd things happening, but we didn't believe them. Our disbelief was short-lived. It began with my four-year-old daughter screaming at something she had seen in the living room. She said it was a black cloud and that it crossed the room and disappeared into the corner. We dismissed it until my wife's sister visited a few days later. She said the cloud reappeared from the same corner and enveloped her two little girls. Later the same day, my wife saw the cloud come from the corner and wrap itself around her. She said it was suffocating, hot and stank of sulfur and burning meat. The cloud seemed to only manifest itself around women and girls. Unfortunately for my sons, males were not spared the haunting. The front door of the old house squeaked loudly and no amount of WD-40, graphite, or silicone gel would quiet it. Now, to understand the layout of the house, one has to realize that it was built into the side of a hill. The front door faced the west and one would have to enter there onto the second floor which is where the living room, dining room, kitchen, and bathrooms all were. The bedrooms and laundry room were on the first floor, which could be accessed by the east-facing back door. One night, the boys, aged eight and six, heard the front door open, so they went to investigate. In the open front door, they could see an odd green-colored mist. When they approached the door to see where the glow was originating, the glow disappeared. The younger boy discovered the specter's aversion to pleasant smells. My wife set out a store-bought air fresheners, but this was useless. Once a room would be vacated, the fresheners would close. It was my younger son who pointed out this phenomenon as well as the fact that scented candles would extinguish themselves once the room was empty as well. The older boy was beset with his own terror. Frequently, he would wake up on the bottom bunk to find a horrific and contorted face shrieking at him. The face was aged and wrinkled, and the gender of the entity was undefined. He would also learn to put away his playthings. One night, he was roused by the sound of his toys moving around on the floor. He looked to see small black beings moving trucks, warships, and cars against the door, as if to barricade it from entry. When they noticed that he was watching them, they turned and began climbing the covers trying to get at him. He screamed and I came running to find him clinging to the bottom of the bunky boards of his brother's upper bed. Up to this point, I hadn't seen anything, so I was still somewhat skeptical of all the stories. That changed on the last night of the haunting. We were asleep downstairs and I was dreaming 
I dreamt that I walked into our bedroom, but there was no bedroom furniture there. It was furnished as a living room, and on the sofa sat the most beautiful red-headed woman I had ever seen. Now, my wife, beautiful in her own right, is a brunette, but in this dream, I knew the redhead to be my wife. She was crying, and she turned and looked at me with fear-filled eyes. I should have had pity for this woman, but all I felt was rage. She cowered into the arm of the sofa, and I started towards her to continue the beating I knew she deserved. It was when I heard a voice that I realized that the dream had been silent up until that point. In my dream, I knew that this was because my wife was deaf. The voice I had heard was this of a six-year-old. I turned and looked to the doorway to see my real life son standing there in clothes I had never seen before. He was wearing black pants and long-sleeved red pullover. He was soaking wet from head to toe and his skin appeared ashen and lifeless. Again, I felt no love for my family, only a burning rage. The boy looked up at me and said, Dad, he too had a look of object fear in his eyes. But he continued, Dad, help me. I turned towards him and raised a clenched fist and struck the child square in the face. Suddenly I woke up sitting in bed, my wife sitting up as well, screaming at me, what the hell is that? I realized that there was a fight going on in the living room above my head. Two men were yelling at each other, throwing around furniture and breaking glass. I jumped from my bed and ran upstairs. As my foot fell onto the carpeted hallway on the second story, all was silent. No one was there. The windows were intact, the furniture upright, but the door stood open shrouded in an iridescent green glow. Drawn, I approached the door and looked out onto the darkened street. There was nothing. All was quiet. Fallen autumn leaves swirled in the cool night's breeze. I returned to my wife in my room to not sleep. We sat in silence, awaiting the dawn. And dawn did come. As it happened, it was October 31st. I stood on my front porch drinking my coffee, trying to rationalize my dream, and then I heard it. A chill lock into my spine as I heard, help me. I approached as the boy was using a stick to try and dig something out of the ground. It was a strip of black corduroy. I went to help him, but pulled him away when I saw the flash of white bone. I grabbed my son and ran into the house. The police dug up the body of a little boy. He was six when he died. He was wearing black corduroy pants and a long-sleeved red pullover. My brother is now a detective on our local police department. Although they have a lengthy file on the boy's father, they remain unable to locate him or his beautiful, deaf, red-headed wife. Signed, A.J. That is a fantastic story. Holy smokes. I am seriously left with so many questions. Um, holy. I would love to just have a few minutes and talk to you. <laughs> holy, that was a really good story. And guess what, guys? He sent us a second one. So, instead of leaving us hanging like I do to you guys with my book... I'm going to start reading the second story now. This one is titled The Old Woman's House. In the fall of 1972, my family would soon be moving away from the OKC area, so I knew this would be my last Halloween with my best friend, Butch. His real name was Frank, but his dad called him Butch as a baby, and the name stuck. He and I had just started the fifth grade. Due to the way their birthdays fell, Butch's older sister, Patty, was in the same grade with us. She was only 10 months older. 
The three of us had been friends since first grade, and we spent a lot of time together since their grandparents lived next door to my family. Across the street, down the block, just a ways lived T. Dalton. He was an a-hole. He had beaten up every kid in the neighborhood. There were rumors that he had misused a young girl who lived across the alley from him. He liked to brag that he was descended from the same bunch who made up the Dalton gang that had terrorized Oklahoma-Kansas border around the turn of the century. We had no reason not to believe him. Then there was the old woman. She lived in the creepy old two-story house down the block, across from Dalton. We used to see her sweeping her front porch, muttering to herself. She never talked to anyone, and it seemed no one ever came to visit her. Being kids, we just said she was a witch, and that her creepy old house was haunted. The only lights we ever saw in her house appeared to be from candles that she carried from room to room. Patty, Butch, and I were a little too old for trick-or-treating, but we still put on the mask just to score some free candy. We stopped just before we got to the old lady's house so we could decide whether or not to cross Northwest 10th Street and go to the houses over there. We just made up our minds to do so when Dalton stepped from the shadows and grabbed Butch in a headlock. Butch was screaming to be let go of. Patty and I were punching and kicking Dalton with all we had. He backhanded Patty and then grabbed me from the throat and said, If you want me to let him go, you're going to have to go and bring me the old witch's broom. I said, She ain't a witch. And you know it. Now let him go. You're hurting him. Yeah, I'm gonna keep hurting him until you bring me that broom, he said. Patty and I ran up the stairs and looked all over the front porch, but we couldn't find the broom. She must have taken it inside. I shouted down to Dalton. Now let him go. Butch hadn't given up fighting, but the more he fought, the tighter Dalton squeezed his head. Then you're going to have to go inside and get it, he said. I yelled, I'm not going in there. Just go get it, yelled Butch. This a-hole won't let me go if you don't. So Patty and I tried the front door. It was open. The house was dark. But we could see well enough to tell that there wasn't any furniture in the parlor or living room. I found the broom and whispered for Patty as I went out the front door. The door slammed behind me as I threw the broom down to Dalton. When he reached for it, he lost his grip on Butch, who promptly broke free and kicked him right square in the privates. It was the first time any of us kids had put Dalton onto the ground. Butch ran up to me, smiling at his triumph. Where's Patty, he asked. She was right behind me, I said, as I tried to open the door. It was locked. It was an old-style lock that required a skeleton key. We tried to, looking through the windows, but we couldn't see anything. I started pounding on the door as Butch ran around trying the back door. No luck. We were frantic. Butch finally threw caution to the wind and broke one of the front windows. He unlocked and raised the sash, and we both climbed inside. We couldn't find a light switch but we did manage to find candles and matches. We looked all around the first floor, but could not find Patty. We also noted that the dining room and kitchen also had no furniture. Then we saw Patty cross the hallway and go into another room upstairs. She had no reason to go up there, but that was the only place that we hadn't looked yet. We crept up the stairs and found nothing. No patty, no old woman, nothing but empty rooms. Completely empty rooms. It was as though no one had lived there at all. We were no longer being quiet. We ran from room to room, yelling for Butch's sister. You better go get your dad, he said, without thinking. I grabbed the front door and opened it freely. I took hold of Butch's jacket collar and pulled him out with me 
and shut the door. What did you do that for? he asked as he tried to go back in. The door was locked again. That's why, I said, as I ran to go get my dad. Mom, Dad, Butch and Patty's folks, and everyone else came running. Still, we couldn't find her. They eventually called the police, who went over the house with a fine-tooth comb. They determined that no one had lived there in many years. All the adults in the neighborhood insisted that they had seen the old woman at the house. One officer confirmed that he, too, had seen her. Still, the cops could not find any sign of Patty. Butch and I had to recount our story several times to the police. Dalton insisted that he hadn't even seen us that night, but no one believed him. Mom and Dad delayed moving away for two weeks to do what they could to help find Patty. In the end, we had to move away. The city eventually tore down that old house. They didn't use bulldozers, opted instead for sledgehammers and pry bars, tearing it down stick by stick. They never found anything. Even after digging up the old basement, Patty had simply vanished. And, uh, signed AJ. Wow, both of those stories were, uh, amazing stories. Really amazing stories. Um, yeah, definitely leaving me scratching my head. <laughs> uh, definitely would love to talk to you some more, AJ. Uh, I think that it would be really cool if you check the uh, comment section if you have time. And anyways, guys, I think that's going to be it for this evening. Uh, hopefully you noticed the thunder that was carrying on in the background. I actually stopped recording uh, the story and just uh, recorded the thunder out the window. It was really quiet, but it was just one continuous thunder. Crazy sound I've ever heard. I had to run and turn off the air conditioner because I realized that it was probably overpowering most of the sounds. But I hope you enjoyed that as well. Okay, guys, you know I love ya. Hope to see you back here in a day or two. Bye for now.